about a third of all um, migrants uh, from the island during this time period. Um, and then, so one over here, this is Puerto Rico, so there is mi migration back and forth, and so the red is the outflow to the mainland, and then the green is inflow from the mainland to the island. So there has been some outflow from Florida, and we have Pennsylvania, New York, um, and Texas is actually the fourth largest receiving area of migrants. In fact, if you just look at adults, Texas is the third largest. Again, this is pre-Maria. Um, I don't have it up here, but also there's a lot of interstate migration of Puerto Ricans, and so Florida is also the largest receiving area of the interstate migrants. To the point, and I don't have the number here, um, but there are now more estimated people who identify as being Puerto Rican living in Florida than in New York. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll skip that. So that was all pre-Maria. Uh, so what do the migration patterns look like after Hurricane Maria? Obviously, data can be a, a challenge to get. Um, but what we did was we looked at what other uh, some of our other colleagues did. So the start green, these are our estimates of where the migrants from Puerto Rico were going uh, to the mainland. Uh, this was up, I think, through, up through 2016. And then post-Maria, what have other colleagues found? Um, the red, this is the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Uh, and we can see Florida, again, is the big winner, the big receiver of the, migra of the migrants from the island of Puerto Rico. Uh, CNN actually had a couple of reports uh, where they were looking at um, the FEMA, uh, the address forms uh, that were filed uh, for FEMA, and then also a change of address form with the U.S. Post Office. Uh, and so the, the yellow is the FEMA, and then the blue is the Post Office. And then there was kind of an interesting, well, I thought it was very interesting, um, not really from a social science perspective, but a group called Terralytics was tracking cell phone data, and so the 787 cell phones as they migrated, migrated over to the, the mainland. And they noticed that even though that's not a social science approach, all of these <coughs> studies point to very consistent patterns that, that we saw leading up to Hurricane Maria, which means that a lot of the things that we observe in terms of characteristics, socioeconomic outcomes, uh, before, shortly before Hurricane Maria struck. Uh, would be interesting to keep in mind as we want to help uh, integrate uh, these migrants into new communities. Um, and so this is just giving a snapshot. We, in our book, we, we talk about, in fact, somebody told us we probably have enough for like eight books because we have all these interesting things that we think are interesting. Um, but this is just to show you differences in terms of the characteristics. So it's not this random dispersal. Um, that people are just leaving the island and going where the wind blows. They're tapping into different types of, of migration networks. Uh, and so this is just a breakdown of labor force characteristics. These are uh, adults between the ages of 25 and 64. Uh, the yellow, this is a percentage of this population that was employed, and these are recent migrants. Um, the green is they're officially unemployed, and then the red is people who are not in the labor force. So they're essentially not looking for work. They're not working, they're not looking for work. Um, Massachusetts and Texas, it almost looks like we have a typo that uh, they're, they're kind of flipped. Um, Texas is a big outlier. Um, many, many, people who are moving from the island to Texas already have jobs, or they find them very quickly. And so employment, about three quarters of, again, the primary uh, migrants were employed, but if we look at Massachusetts, it was about 30%, so not even one third of these recent migrants uh, were employed. And, and so that's just something to keep in mind if the migration post Maria are tapping into the same patterns, um, have the same type of socioeconomic characteristics, then the needs of these migrants will differ. And then just give another snapshot in terms of some of the differences. Uh, poverty rates, so these are people who lived on the island the previous year and they had moved to the mainland. Poverty rates of these new migrants, again, uh, pre Hurricane Maria in Florida, were, uh, was about a third, 32%, the below the poverty line. Um, the traditional receiving areas, so states like Pennsylvania, uh, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, um, poverty rates close to 60%. Uh, <coughs> um, Texas, is low relative to the other groups at 14%, but it's still high. And then some of the differences, again, relate to employment. Um, education levels also different. So these are ad, ad, average education levels where those going to Texas um, average about 14 years, or almost 14 and a half years, uh, versus less than 11 years, those in uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut. So what can we learn from these differences? Uh, we need to consider that post-disaster migrants will likely have different needs. Uh, so again, it's not just a one-size-fits-all model. So people moving to Texas, if they have high, a high likelihood of being employed, um, they may have more needs in terms of thinking about uh, assistance with childcare or perhaps housing close to where they work uh, versus uh, migrants going to other areas may need, more, uh, may need more help with respect to finding employment or uh, perhaps if, uh, accessing education. And so it's important to understand the characteristics of pre-disaster migrants uh, to anticipate the needs and facilitate the successful integration of the post-disaster migrants uh, into the specific destination areas. 
uh, without appropriate assistance. Um, one thing to consider is if this migration is relatively permanent, um, if their needs are not met, then this might exacerbate some of the socioeconomic disparities that we see among uh, certain populated, particularly among Puerto Ricans in the traditional free sleeping areas. And so in closing, um, it's important to emphasize that Puerto Rico was already encountering this major economic crisis before Hurricane Maria struck. Uh, the New York Times had an article, I think, in early 2017, so again, before the hurricane, uh, that were describing what was happening in Puerto Rico as being a humanitarian <coughs> crisis. Um, and so uh, things were already in dire shape in many regards uh, before the hurricane. Uh, and it's imperative to rebuild Puerto Rico and ease the crisis that is leading to so much suffering, mental and physical health issues and fatalities that are affecting, again, millions of American citizens. So those are my thoughts. you want to say a few words before we uh, <laughs> sure. start the discussion? Sure. So firstly, thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be on a panel. I'm also a social scientist, and it's very exciting when there's more than one of us here. So really, really exciting. Um, my name is Dr. Amber Silver. I'm an assistant professor here at SUNY in the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity. Um, broadly described, um, I'm a behavioral geographer. So I'm interested in the ways that information influences decision making. And all of my research has been within the context of severe and hazardous weather. So I'm interested in the ways that official and unofficial warning information are influencing protective behaviors, particularly among citizenry. Um, a lot of my research has focused within this risk and crisis communication realm. Um, my training is uh, I'm from Canada, so a lot of my research has a Canadian scope. Um, but since I've been fortunate enough to be here at SUNY, a lot of my work is looking at hurricanes. So I've gathered data from Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Michael in Florence and Hurricane Dorian just this past fall. It is really interesting um, to see how these different communication channels that we have in a plethora, a landscape of communication channels, are influencing how it is that we obtain, interpret, and respond to both official and unofficial warning information uh, regarding severe weather in general, but hurricanes in particular. A lot of my research has focused on the use of social media as a communications tool, particularly in the pre-disaster, that pre-impact time, when people are going through this really complex and dynamic process of milling, where we're gathering information and we're trying to make sense of it, determining whether or not uh, we're going to take action, if we're going to take action, what actions are appropriate. Um, in my research on Hurricane Florence and Michael, we were looking at the use of Twitter as a communications tool. Um, as one of the panelists rightly noted, um, the National Hurricane Center is increasingly using social media as a means of reaching out to citizenry to try to you know, uh, share these really complex uh, forecasts in a way that can be easily understood by the average citizen, right? Not a lot of people understand about uncertainty statements or probability statements and try to use um, plain language to communicate really complicated concepts um, you know, and using social media to do so has been an emergent area of my research. So that is it for me. I was really just looking forward to having this discussion um, between panelists and our audience. Okay, thank you. And thank you to all our panelists for the introduction. Um, so there were some questions um, that uh, Chris Bonecraft and I came up with to sort of ask the uh, panel, and then we asked the panel to contribute questions that they would um, like to answer and address as well. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so I thought we would sort of start with sort of currently sort of some of what we're doing, um, sort of future where things are going, and then also bring in the risk and communication aspects of things, sort of um, thinking about pre but also uh, post uh, event. Uh, so the first question for the panel is, what opportunities exist in terms of observing systems and use of models to pr improve um, the provision of useful hurricane forecasts? So what can, um, how can we make better forecasts, but also um, provide and make sure that information is being communicated to the public? <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, in terms of observations, Stephanie brought up uh, very 
recent satellites that were launched, GO-16 and GO-17, which are giving us a wealth of information, but to the best of my knowledge, that in all, not all of that is being integrated into the models, and I think one big area that I think we scientists are doing a lot of work, and we still need to do a lot of work things on is uh, integrating that information into the models and process known as data simulation. <coughs> I think that's, that's one, of, one of the big areas at the moment and that it will continue to be for the next five, ten years, probably longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just, yeah, I would agree. I think right now our satellite data, we have uh, an increasing, so much data that we don't know what to do with it right now. And we're vastly underutilizing what we have available to us in terms of applying it to forecasts. Um, so I agree with Rosie. That's a huge area that uh, I think we'll require a lot of work over the next few years. Uh, another observing system that maybe in the future uh, we're moving towards is unmanned aircraft. Um, there's been some missions by NASA and uh, even NOAA had a uh, unmanned drone that they flew that they launched from one of the manned aircraft. Um, but getting observations where we can't necessarily send humans safely, uh, but we can send a, a, an instrument that we can control uh, remotely uh, I think that will be something in the future in terms of hurricane prediction that may help us uh, get more observations that we can't currently get uh, that will then lead to better forecasts um, if we can assimilate that information into our models properly. So I think I'll just add one more thing, which, I, which is the, the aspect to kind of build more coupled forecasts, so beyond just kind of atmosphere only and there's been a lot of research to suggest that the ocean state, not only the surface, but what's happening you know, a little bit below the ocean surface is actually pretty important for getting things like intensification right, as well as sometimes track. And so that's, I think, a big area. I mean, that's beyond, I think, just hurricanes. I think that's happening in the weather forecast, and especially when you get to kind of longer than one week forecast, that the ocean becomes very important. And so I think that's an area that, uh, that has continuously been improving, but I think we're starting to see a pretty rapid improvement in that area, which I think would be really useful for, for hurricane forecasting. Yeah, and adding on to the, the theme that emerged with the impacts, like mm -hmm. hazards, and when we think about rainfall and runoff, like we we need other sets of models, like river runoff models that have to be like, communicating with what the atmospheric model is saying, as well as if you have a situation like a storm surge, like this year, there was a big concern with the Mississippi River being at record high levels and the possibility of a storm surge from um, Hurricane, I'm forgetting the name, Barry. Barry, thank you. It was barely a hurricane. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, having that information, the exchange of information, not just the atmosphere, the ocean, the rivers. Yeah, I mean, I guess just that, I'll just add to that because, right, oftentimes, especially with some of these slow moving hurricanes, um, you know, the biggest, imp not the biggest, but one of the largest impact on some communities can actually be two, three days after when those, when all those waters start to erode, you know, come down the rivers. And that type of flooding, that type of prediction is sometimes lost in the kind of, oh, this hurricane just hit, now we're trying to, to figure out what's, what's gone bad. And you still have flooding occurring that's new in other areas that I think is sometimes not appreciated, but I think starting to grow appreciated, especially with the national water model and ways to start to get at that hydrology model. Yeah. And I'd actually like to jump in there as well to think about how the forecast can also tie in with, like, let's say, man-made structures. So, so things like the road system. So after Hurricane Maria struck, apparently it was 97% of the roads were impassable. And so just having an understanding of how these storms are going to be interacting with the basic infrastructure that's in a given location. Um, in addition, the electrical grid was already in a very weakened state. Uh, and in fact, the year before Hurricane Maria, there was an island-wide blackout. So it was not that the, basically the physical infrastructure was already uh, challenged uh, before the storm struck. And so that was part of the reason there was such catastrophic destruction. Right, so I think there were a couple of things that were touched on there that sort of flow into other questions. So I know Stephanie, you submitted you sent a question about the amount of data we have. And I think in your slides and Rosie's slides, we really saw all of the observations and models, that all of the, the data that's being produced. So I think in addition to social science and atmospheric scientists, that, that people who know how to deal with big data um, and know how to manage data sets is another aspect of things to consider. Because we do have a lot of um, 
forecaster is overwhelmed with the number of products they can look at, but even as researchers, we're overwhelmed with um, more models running at higher resolution, running ensembles like those spaghetti plots. Um, so thinking about the best way to manage our data in terms of storage, but also presenting it, I think is really important moving forward. Um, and another thing I think that Kevin touched on was um, slow moving source. That there was a, a recent paper um, that, that showed that in a warming climate, or that recently, using data, that storms have been moving slower over the last few decades. Um, so if you think about hazards produced by slow moving storms, um, that's more of a, more impacts um, thinking about moving forward, which, um, so the next question is how do we expect hurricane activity to change um, and sort of what tools are we using to think about that change? So that's kind of, yeah. So I'll start, but um, I, th I think actually about, if we did this two or three years ago, I think I would have had a more consensus view on actually how we expect North Atlantic storms to change. But I think actually as these tools have advanced to the point where now we're not just doing projections into the future and kind of using atmosphere only simulations, we're doing coupled simulations in the future at these resolutions that actually the uncertainty and actually storm count has actually kind of increased, meaning some models and some, some weather forecasts are, for example, some, some modeling forecast centers suggest that there'll be an increase in the future where the long-standing consensus that there was going to be a decrease. And so we're kind of, this is an example, I think the big data and the new tools that come online can kind of change the way you're thinking about things. So when it, when it comes to the number of storms and I think where storms are going to be, I think it's uncertain. When it comes to, I think that, I think we can assume, and I think the research suggests that the storms on average will become stronger. And what that means is actually not necessarily clear because, right, if, I, if, if I'm, a, I'm a climate scientist, so I'm gonna come out and say, oh, they're gonna be on average five meters per second stronger, but that doesn't actually, I always use this term, which is kind of, a little smile too, but that doesn't really mean anything, right? Because, <laughs> because if you tell somebody that, oh, the storms on average are gonna be five meters per second stronger, I mean, what, first of all, you said by average, so you're just going to plan for every storm to be five meters per second stronger, because if that's the case, it doesn't seem that bad, right? But the thing is, is it's a shift of the distribution, right? It's that it's the strong storms are coming stronger in ways that we don't even necessarily quite understand or, well, or can even forecast at the time. Um, and so that's kind of why we've shifted our focus beyond those type of, the kind of the ones, you know, the intensity from a category and focus more on the hazards, because that's what these models can actually maybe do a little bit better job at, at kind of coming into understanding about. And I think focusing, for example, on precipitation is one of them, um, because that's that's something that these models are kind of built built and continually being proved to do. They're not perfect, um, but, but, um, but things like precipitation are actually well constrained from the basic laws of, of physics and, and, and energy conservation. And so we kind of we kind of understand that the models should be doing these on, on first order pretty well. Uh, and so from that case, I mean, it, it seems to be not only attribution work of recent storms, but also kind of future projections of, of, of travel cyclones, it seems to be that there is going to be an increase in, in precipitation associated with storms. Uh, and there's going to be an not even just an increase in the precipitation, but also a pretty significant increase in the extreme precipitation associated with those storms. Um, and, and that might be a combination, but that's not even including when you combine it with the fact that they're maybe expected to be slower moving or one thing that's not talked about or appreciated that well, I think not only in, in the scientific community, but in the public as a whole, is the size, right? Size of storms means that you can increase the area of impact, which also has applications for things like storm surge. Um, and that's unclear uh, of whether storms are going to get uh, larger, but, but that's something I think we should really put a lot of focus on, because that would, that's kind of a first order thing that if, if we can come out and say storms are changing in size, then that's going to impact all of the hazards we talk about. So that seems like something you should zoom back to and start to focus on. Um, and so I think we're starting to get there with some of the tools that we're developing. I think the traditional approach of, of kind of running a bunch of simulations and trying to look at trends something that's really useful in the climate science community should do, but in terms of how that applies to, to decision makers and how that even applies to, to, to people along the coastlines. I think new coming up with new approaches, which is whether it's these type of storyline approach, which allows you to put perspective into how a storm in the past would be different in the future, which of course is still not a perfect way to do it, but it's an opportunity to actually engage in the way decision making is done, uh, is one of the potential tools to really kind of at least advance that translation of the science to the actual practicality of using that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I mean, I've been doing this attribution stuff, so I think it's, it's one of the tools, but I'll just mention that I think 
one of the potential advances would be to start doing this type of attribution operationally. And I think a lot of people in the scientific community are a little cautious about that, but I think you don't have to go very far. If you just go to our uh, to a different extreme of weather event like heat waves, and we go to our, our European counterparts, which they have had multiple years of devastating heat waves. Um, and that, this is something that they're actually talking about. Their governments are looking at going to real-time attribution to not only better forecast, right, you better forecast heat waves, but to understand what what are why are these worse than they were 20 years ago is something that that's that's really on the minds of, of other nations. And so I think that that's something that might help communicate the, the changes. Just to piggyback on that, um, I'm really gratified to hear this you know, emphasis for a whole hazards approach. Um, in my research, it is really interesting to grapple with the ways that people are perceiving hurricane hazards. There's a you know there's a general understanding that a tropical storm is you know less serious than a category two, which is less serious than maybe a category five, but there's not an appreciation of the fact that you know, those categories are determined based on wind speed and not necessarily other types of hazards. Mm -hmm. And so um, just during Hurricane Dorian, um, made landfall, direct landfall in Nova Scotia, Canada, almost an identical path as Hurricane Juan, which devastated uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality in 2003. And we gathered both social media data and questionnaire data for that storm. And it was really interesting to see the discourse because what people wanted to know was, is this going to be a Category 1 or a Category 2, period. Regardless of the fact that whether Dorian made landfall as a Category 1 or 2, the difference would have only been at about like a 10 mile per hour wind speed. And so there was this real emphasis on emergency management in Nova Scotia to try to tell people it actually doesn't matter whether it is a high-end Category 1 or a low-end Category 2, the impacts are going to be essentially the same. We're looking at intense rainfall, lots of flooding. Nova Scotia actually issued its first ever uh, voluntary evacuation for storm surge for parts of the coast. Um, and so it was a real challenge to try to move away from this, you know, is it a category one or a category two or a category three, and to emphasize or focus more clearly on the associated hazards of that storm. I'd like to jump in there as well. I think that might be very helpful to also educate the media on that because I think the media also play up into that. Because I've been, like, again, using Hurricane Maria as an example, uh, Hurricane Maria had been, a, had been a very strong Category 5. Um, and it did weaken right before it made landfall. And I remember the news, I was like, oh, phew, like, this is great. Like, it's only a Category, only a category 4. Uh, but it was only two miles shy of a Category 5. Which, so whether you're two miles or three, I mean, it, it, it doesn't really matter. But I think that, I, I, just from what I've observed, to some extent, people might let their guard down because oh, it's, it's weakened, it's not such a big thing. We saw that with Hurricane Katrina as well. Right, so I think both of you sort of highlighted, or three of you highlighted, what are some of the challenges we still face um, when communicating hurricane forecasts to the public? Um, and I think there's been a, a sort of a certain outpouring of trying to really a, a focus on trying to improve our communication with some of the graphics that I think um, that Stephanie mentioned. However, there are still some big challenges um, to sort of properly convey what the researchers and, and forecasters know is risk um, to the public, also the science and the risk. So what are some of the biggest challenges? You sort of touched on some, but there are other big challenges you sort of see, and what can we do to sort of move forward to um, improving that communication? I think like educating the media for a few and the people who are actually reporting the news or the reporting of the weather. <coughs> In terms of challenges, like I'm no social scientist, but I can speak about what I perceive. I have a Facebook page in which I try to just simply put the weather forecast from the National Hurricane Center in words that I think my friends and relatives can understand. And I say I think because I'm no expert again. And people want very, very specific information. I mean, they want to know, like in Puerto Rico being the small island, they want to know which like municipality is going to receive the center of the storm. Um, they want to know if they should stay at a high at a high rise that it's near their job, or if they should go to the relatives in the countryside at the risk of not being able to get back to the job for a week, for weeks, but being safe at least. Um, they they want very very um, specific information, and I think this this is across the board. They're also very uncomfortable with the concept of uncertainty. 
even though, like um, Rebecca Moore said yesterday, like uncertainty is there and it's always going to be there because the atmosphere is a chaotic system. But um, using Dorian as an example, the forecasts were changing and the comments I was getting was like, oh, you meteorologists can't decide what's going to happen. It's very confusing. One meteorologist says it's coming, the other says it's not coming. And so, like, I think it all boils down to communication in the end, but I obviously I, I have no solutions, but um, how we use the wealth of information that we have to make it, put it into words that the public can use to make decisions that are not going to be as specific as your house is going to be flooded, but there is a chance that something is going to happen in this vicinity. Like, yeah, how we translate that information into something that is useful within the limit of uncertainty that we have is it's a big, big challenge. Kind of piggybacking off of that, I think a problem that the atmospheric science community faces is a lot of the data that our forecasters are looking at is freely available to anybody in the public. Mm -hmm. They can go on a website and look at the models themselves, and a lot of times, even though they're not educated on how to properly uh, understand that information, they're digesting it and making decisions. And there's uh, people spreading that information on social media in unofficial ways. Um, I think you had mentioned unofficial information being spread on Twitter. And um, it's, a, it's a great resource that we have all the data freely available, but there's also a burden that comes with that of being sure that the public can understand that in the proper way and get the messages in the proper way. Um, and I also don't have a solution, but that's another challenge we face. Yeah, just speaking of Hurricane Dorian, as a social scientist watching that storm unfold, it was a wild ride. I mean, with the forecast changing in itself, but then all of the blowback from Sharpie Gate and the president and uh, the National Hurricane Center and you know, NOAA and all of that um, really interesting um, evolution, I guess we can say, over time. I'm professionally very interested to know whether and how that's going to have any long-term impact in terms of citizen like trust of the citizenry in uh, NHC forecasts. It was very interesting to compare what was going on in the United States with what was going on in Canada as Hurricane Dorian was happening. So as Sharpie Gate was trending on Twitter and all of this, you know, really interesting discussion was coming about about, you know, do forecasters even know what they're doing? And it's one of those jobs where you can be wrong 90% of the time and still get a paycheck and all of this nonsense. In Canada, none of that dialogue was happening, even though for it was seven days, I believe, before it made landfall in Nova Scotia, that all of this issues of trust and mistrust and or confusion and communication was happening. None of that seemed to make it through customs almost. Like it stopped at the border. <laughs> in that um, people were quite sad the questionnaire that we disseminated, people were actually quite satisfied in the forecast information that they received, and they received it from a variety of sources. So we have a Canadian hurricane center in Canada, so they were getting forecasts from there. They were comparing that to forecasts that were being released by the NHC. They were coming, you know, to personal judgments about the, a lot of the research. I uh, did interviews with uh, people who have to be on boats, so fishermen and fisher people and um, uh, coast guards and things like that, in terms of whether or not they wanted to know whether they're going to put their boats in the water. So this is life or death decision making during a hurricane, right? And none of that. Uncertainty or confusion or lack of trust um, made it through its ways in our interviews. And so we're really interested to, to try to, to poke at that and to see what exactly it was about the forecast and the way that they're communicated that encouraged that trust. Just a comment on that. One of the things that I've been interested in is how, particularly the United States, exactly the kind of matters uh, you were just talking about. Uh, are a function of or closely associated with the spread of pseudoscience and, and anti science. Uh, and those spread like wildfire through, uh, through social media. You know, in the past, your flat earther would have been seen as, well, the crazy dude in the corner is handing out some pamphlets. But now, on social media, to get trained to the untrained person, this sounds as authoritative as what you're putting out. Uh, because it just, it, people are just not distinguishing it. And there are people out there uh, promoting it. So you have uh, everything from what? You know, anti vax, flat earth, uh, climate, climate denial, 
uh, all these uh, uh, hoaxes, uh, uh, conspiracy theories out there about you know, uh, meteorologists being in cahoots with the Chinese who create uh, 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 Those are things that are actually being said and spread out there. Yep. And uh, we need to adapt to them and get ahead of that. But it's interesting because you said to the untrained eye. Or just, so, which is the best Which problem. is a problem in itself, which right? The that, that children who are going through school, I mean, aren't we all sort of, shouldn't there be some basis of what the knowledgeable sources are? There seems like that's... That's, that's very much missing. Because right. Because it's the idea that all opinions are somehow equal. Right. I would and push. that's not what democracy is about. Democracy is about all opinions being able to be expressed, not as being more equal. Is that your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the Constitution. <laughs> it's, about, it's about being able to express it. Um, it's about being treated equally. So, I've done a lot of, you know, for my stage in my career, and one of the things that I've been really interested in is this, this concept of misinformation and the process of misinformation management. And so, unquestionably, misinformation, whether it's deliberate, so someone is trolling and creating fake infographics, which actually we saw with yeah, Hurricane Maria, yeah, and they created a um, false cone of uncertainty that showed Maria was going to make direct landfall over Houston, which of course had just been affected by Kirby. Um, so that caused a lot of panic and confusion. So it is certainly an issue, but it is not an insurmountable one. And so there's been some very encouraging research, I'm thinking um, especially by Dr. Jeanette Sutton, that looks at this whole process of collective error correction and misinformation management. And there's actually a lot that we can do as professionals to help encourage that process, whether it's creating sort of an online presence that people can come to know and trust as a source of information during city state times. Um, people are also, you say that, um, you know, we're not experts, all experts necessarily in meteorology, which is absolutely true for citizenry, but we are pretty good at Noticing when someone, like if, if you see something on the internet that's wrong, you just have the inclination to say that's wrong and to show that you know that it's wrong. And so there is a little bit of that, you know, that, that is happening more broadly. And so all of that is to say, yes, misinformation is a challenge, especially when it comes to situations that are high in urgency and uncertainty, such as hurricanes. But it's not all doom and gloom. There is a glimmer of, of hope there in terms of collective error correction and how we make sense of these uh, very complicated situations as social groups. Okay, um, that's first what I want to say. I was just like taking down some notes. I'm from the anti-war movement. And I was like thinking about if Wall Street profits from these type of disasters and um, secondly, like when he dropped a 21,000 pound bomb on Afghanistan, how did that affect the climate? And thirdly, connected to all this, is the Pentagon's culpability in creating disasters and stuff like that. Because I know that Cindy Sheehan, she's a major activist, she talks about the Pentagon and climate change.